Jacob, when's your climb? What day is your climb? Next Saturday? Yes. Sunday. Sunday. Next Sunday. 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 8.30 in the morning. 8.30 in the morning. Okay. In New York. Where? No, in Kansas City. Kansas City. Kansas City. Okay. Well, we've been praying for you. So. Next week, we're going to begin the story. And for the 31 weeks following that, we are going to be looking at God's story, man's story, and our story. We're going to begin in the book of Genesis with the creation and then we're going to be going week by week, day by day, chronologically, through the Bible. You are going to be reading the Bible every day. Okay. You can do it individually or you can do it as a couple, as a family. And if you do not have the books that you need, we will give them to you this morning in Sunday school. And I have a handout that I will give to you so that you will know what to read on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Rather than trying to read 12 pages on Saturday night, you're going to read two and a half pages Monday and two and a half pages on Tuesday, etc. And then we're going to come together and on Sunday morning, I'm going to speak from the <coughs> chapter that, uh, of the scripture that we're reading that day or that week. And then we're going to go into Sunday school and we're going to discuss, not so much my sermon, but you can do that, but we're going to discuss different issues that come out of the readings and the story for the week. And as we go through, we're going to be putting together things and we're going to be seeing how God has worked ever since the beginning with men and with women. We're going to see how He has prepared and planned and looked not only at the present, but also at the future. And then we're going to be looking at how men and women in their existence during a given period of time, some of the things that happened to them, and how God's hand was in their lives. These are the stories that we're going to find in the Bible. But then as we go through and we look, we're going to see that God has equally been working in each of our lives. You know, we're living in a big universe. We're living in... in, in uh, there, there's just no telling how deep and how far out the universe goes. The more scientists put up satellites and do research and other things, the further out they find that things are happening. Now some of those scientists don't believe in God. But some do. I would say probably more do than don't, but I don't have any way of knowing that. But. But when you look at the universe and you look at what is happening out there and you think about the fact that all of this is occurring and very seldom do you have collisions. 
You know, we worry, and one of the things in the news reports is we worry about that uh, that big uh, asteroid that's coming and we have these near misses to Earth. They're not near misses. God's in charge. If He wants to take us all out with an asteroid, He's going to do it. But that's not what the Bible talks about. And we're going to look and we're going to see how God is working in our lives. As I look back in my, in, in my life and, and I've seen things that have happened, I, I see that, that there are times when I did not realize God was there. But He was. And He got me out of some situations that uh, there was no way I could have gotten out of uh, on my own. But He did it. And so, as we look at the story next, beginning next week, we're going to, I hope and I believe, draw closer to God and draw closer to an understanding of how God is working in your life and my life. And how He loves us. And, 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 and living in a world that, where we are surrounded by evil, where we are surrounded by men and women who lay on their beds and plot evil uh, against us and against God's people and, and all that, we can trust in God. This morning as we come to the time of the Lord's Supper, I'm not going to preach a message. I'm going to read some scripture and I'm going to talk about it a little bit, but we're just going to take and look at God's Word and see how God has been working in the lives of humans ever since the time of the creation. In the book of Exodus, and I'm not going to read a passage from that, the next passage, I'm, the passage I'm going to read is in Jeremiah chapter 31. If you want to turn there, but in the book of Exodus, Exodus, God takes His people, the children of Israel, out of a land of captivity in Egypt, and He takes them to a mountain. That mountain is called Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb. It's got two different names, but this is the mountain where God spoke to Moses and gave Moses the command. To go to Pharaoh and say to Pharaoh, God says, let my people go. And we know how Pharaoh rebelled against that. And he said to Moses, he says, I do not know your God. Why would I listen to him? And so God sends ten plagues. And we're going to see this more in detail. But, but God sends ten plagues and He forces Pharaoh to let His people go. And when they come to Mount Sinai, God comes down on the top of the mountain. He speaks with Moses and with Aaron and He, and he shows His glory uh, to His people that, at, at the base of the, of the mountain. And He enters into a covenant relationship with them. He says to them, You have seen with what mighty hand I have brought you out of Egypt. And He says, Now I want you to be My people and I want you to live for Me and I want you to, to tell the world about Me. The only true God. And so God offers a covenant relationship to the people of Israel and they all say, Everything that God says we will do. And so Moses is instructed by God to erect a tabernacle. A tent of meeting. A tent where God was going to dwell among His people as they moved through the wilderness to the promised land that God was going to give them. When they got to the promised land, they rejected God and decided they weren't going to go in. And God said, because you have rejected me, 
you're going to wander for 40 years. But when Moses made that temple, erected that tabernacle that God had instructed him to, he sprinkled blood all over the items that was in that tabernacle. Blood of a lamb, blood of a, 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 a bull. He sprinkled it to make it holy, to cleanse it, to purify it. So that it would be a place where God's presence could dwell. For years, the children of Israel lived with the covenant that God had made with them. Although they broke the covenant, although the people, the humans broke the covenant, God was faithful. And in Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning with verse 31, God says something to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a prophet. He is a spokesman for God. And God says to Jeremiah, you tell my people that there is going to come a time when I am going to make a new covenant with you. And in verse 31 of chapter 31, we see God speaking. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their sins and will remember their sins no more. God said to the children of Israel, through a, 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 a Jeremiah the prophet, as the people were going off into captivity, there's going to come a time when God is going to make a new covenant. The old covenant is going to be done away with. It's not a replace, it's not a, a renewal of the old covenant. It is a new covenant. It is totally different from the old covenant. God promises his people. In the book of Luke, Jesus is sitting in the upper room with his disciples. And they are partaking of the Passover meal. Each year, the Passover is celebrated by the Jewish people as a remembrance of what God did in bringing His people, His children, out of the land of captivity in Egypt. The Passover meal is a time of remembrance of the covenant that God made with the people, with His people. Throughout his life, Jesus taught about God. He did things, miracles in the name of his Father. He spoke in the name of his Father. And as we have studied in the Gospel of John, we have seen how in the miracles that are related and in the events that are related in the Gospel of John, how Jesus was preparing the people for a new covenant. That there was going to be a new way of worshiping God. It wasn't going to be through the sacrifices of animals in a tabernacle or in a temple. It was going to be something totally 
you. And as he ate the Passover meal with his disciples in Luke chapter 22, we find these words. Starting with verse 14. Luke 22, 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus says, The old covenant has been completed. I am instituting that new covenant that Jeremiah promised. This is the new covenant, not in the blood of animals, but in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. The Old Covenant could not totally forgive sins. The Old Covenant could not bring a person into a complete relationship with God because there was still the sin factor. But the New Covenant through Jesus is complete, is final, is full. And one more passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning with verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that He has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. A will never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll in all the people. He said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, He sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did He enter heaven to offer Himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting 
for him. You see, Jesus has brought the fulfillment of the new covenant promised by God. He did it through the shedding of His blood for the forgiveness of your sins and mine. And as we come to the table of the Lord to remember that, to remember His act, to remember the salvation that He has brought to us, we do it not in remembrance, but in the not only in remembrance, but in the looking forward to His coming again. All of you, all of us who have accepted Christ as our Savior and Lord, who have received Him into our lives, are invited to share together in.